Andy Ray. I'll be illustrating Genesis and a unified approach to oscillator design. By unified, I mean whether you are designing a low frequency crystal oscillator or a microwave VCO or whether the active device is a fed or bipolar or other options, the design process is the same. And that design process includes linear, nonlinear, noise, and transient analysis. I'll also cover how Genesis is used in this design process. The presentation today describes the complete process, but in much abbreviated form. My latest book, Discrete Oscillator Design, covers these same subjects in more detail. Naturally, if you're interested in oscillator design, I encourage you to read the book. Also, Agilent has made available for download over, uh, over 70 Genesis workspace files. They illustrate oscillator design, including a number of different oscillators, and a template that sets up Genesis for a complete analysis. All you need to do is add your schematic. OK, let's get started with the description of the design process. The first step is to perform a linear analysis. It's tempting to begin with a nonlinear closed loop simulation with oscillation. But in doing so, you're no more informed than with a circuit oscillating on the bench. What's the gain margin? Does the maximum loaded Q occur at the oscillating frequency? What if it doesn't oscillate at all? You won't know why. Linear analysis is that foundation. It identifies the design margin. It's a fast and simpler way to study tuning characteristics. And it can be used for initial estimate of phase noise. And it's quick for exploring new topologies and basic design ideas. More importantly, a linear analysis provides insight into the design process. Though it's a simplified view, it provides an intuitive understanding of how oscillators work. Unfortunately, it only provides a qualitative grasp of the operating levels and harmonics. But I'll address this later. Two methods are used for linear analysis. The popular method for microwave oscillators, particularly VCOs, is the one-port reflection method. Most, uh, excuse me, most authors refer to this as a negative resistance analysis. Actually, they're both negative resistance and negative conductance oscillators. And the difference is not merely semantic. The negative resistance oscillator must use a series resonator, and the negative conductance oscillator must use a parallel resonator. The initial analysis of the negative resistance oscillator is performed by looking into the device through a series resonator. To form the oscillator, the test port is removed, and that port is grounded. The initial analysis of the negative conductance oscillator is performed by looking into the device across the top of a parallel resonator. To form the oscillator, the test port is removed, and that port is left open. With some circuits, the oscillator does not include a node where the loop can be opened. In this case, the negative resistance or negative conductance analysis method must be used. I'll describe a way around this limitation later. The open loop method has been preferred for years for lower frequency oscillators, including crystal oscillators. Actually, I prefer this method even for microwave oscillators. It provides more insight into numerous oscillator behaviors. It also allows estimation of the loaded Q. This is a very important measure of oscillator performance. And besides the confusion over the negative resistance or conductance issue, there are other misconceptions about the one-port method that are avoided using the open-loop cascade technique. Both linear analysis methods are covered in detail in my book. In the presentation today, I'll concentrate on the open-loop method. Consider this 40 megahertz Colputz oscillator using an LC resonator and a FET. It's typical of common drain or common collector oscillators where the source or emitter is connected to the capacitive tap. For the open loop cascade method, I've opened the loop at this point. 
between the source and the capacitive tap. The open loop cascade input is a capacitive tap, and the cascade output is at the source. Capacitor C4, uh, excuse me, I don't see C4 on my schematic. Excuse me, capacitor C3 is used to couple output power from the oscillator into a 50 ohm load. Uh, here's C4. C4 is used to avoid the simulator termi termination resistance from disturbing the oscillator bias. With a common grain amplifier, the output impedance at the source is generally low, and the input impedance at the gate is high. The capacitive tap transforms the low impedance of the source up to the high impedance of the gate. I've chosen an initial loop termination resistance of 50 ohms. I could have also opened the loop at the gate. The impedance at this node is higher, and a higher port resistance would need to be chosen. Resistor R2 is a bias resistor that stabilizes the quiescent drain current below the device IDSS. Common drain and common collector configurations are typically unstable at some frequency where the device has gain. Resistor R1 is often used to stabilize these amplifiers. OK, what are the oscillator starting conditions? Oscillation occurs at the phase zero crossing if the initial linear gain margin is greater than 0 dB. Oscillation does not occur at the gain peak. It occurs at the phase zero crossing. The phase slope at the phase zero crossing should also be negative. The phase characteristics are more important than the amplitude characteristics. When a change occurs in the transmission phase due to temperature, load, noise, or other effects, the oscillation frequency will shift up or down. With shallow slope, the frequency shift is large. With steep slope, the frequency shift is smaller. So the phase, shift, uh, phase slope should be as steep as possible. To take advantage of the phase slope is desirable if the phase zero crossing occurs at the maximum phase slope. Too low a gain margin increases the risk that gain changes might prevent oscillation. And results. it also results in slow starting. Too high a gain margin causes heavy compression, leading to increased phase noise and potentially oscillator instabilities. 3 to 8 dB is a reasonable gain margin for most oscillators. The amplifier should be stable. It's the positive feedback from closing the loop that should cause oscillation. Amplifier instability can result in spurious modes. To utilize the available device gain, the maximum response gain should occur near the phase zero crossing. This is the least critical characteristic and tends to occur naturally when other objectives are satisfied. The predicted response of the open loop cascade assumes the cascade is terminated by the simulator. Later, when the loop is closed, the terminations are provided by the circuit itself. For the analysis to be accurate, the loop matches should be good. I'll discuss this further in a couple of slides. Here are the transmission and reflection responses of the 40 megahertz open loop cascade as simulated in the Genesis simulator. Shown in red, using the left scale, is the magnitude of S21, the gain of the cascade. It peaks at about 3 dB, the low end of my gain target. Shown in blue, using the green scale on the right, is the transmission phase, the angle of S21. I previously adjusted the capacitor C1 in the oscillator to ensure that the phase zero crossing occurs at the target frequency of 40 megahertz. Shown in green, also on the right scale, is the loaded queue of the cascade. The loaded queue is computed by the simulator from the transmission phase slope. The higher the loaded queue, the steeper the phase slope. In this case, the loaded queue is about 10. Plotted on the Smith chart on the right are S11 and S22 of the open loop cascade. S22 is reasonable at about minus 12.7 dB. 
However, S11, the input match at 40 megahertz, is horrible, only about minus 0.3 dB. This match is so poor that the simulated transmission characteristics plotted on the left are significantly an error and are more or less useless. How do we manage this problem? Historically, this problem was managed by redesigning the cascade for better open loop input and output match. Matching networks are not added. This increases circuit complexity and potentially adds additional resonances. Rather, the matches are improved by adjusting the capacitor values in the tap. Changing the simulator termi termination resistance to some other value can also be used to improve the simulation match. But maintaining the termination at 50 ohms makes it easier to confirm the prototype using a standard network analyzer. A major contribution to the art was made by Terry Hoke and Mitch Randall in 2001. Their expression for the true open loop gain when self-terminated by the cascade is computed from the complex two-port S parameters of the open loop cascade. Their equation is given here. Notice that when S12, the reverse transmission of the cascade, and S11 and S22 are small, the expression for G converges to S21. Also notice that when S12 is small, and either S11 or S22 is small, that G also converges to S21. In other words, for devices with a small S12, the simpler, uncorrected open loop analysis is accurate if either S11 or S22 is small. In general, cascade port matches of 12 dB return loss or better results in analysis amplitude errors of 1 dB or less. This expression for G eliminates the error and uncertainty associated with mismatched loops. Post-processing in Genesis makes the computation and display of G the snap. Thank you, Terry and Mitch. OK, let's return to the 40 megahertz oscillator example. <coughs> Excuse me. Next, I'll use optimization in Genesis in an attempt to improve the characteristics of the open loop cascade. Here are the optimization goals specified in the Genesis simulator. Assuming I'll be able to improve the cascade matches, I'll work with the standard S parameters rather than G. The first goal request that the gain at the desired 40 megahertz frequency be 6 dB. The next two goals request the input and output reflections of minus 12 dB or better. The fourth goal requests a loaded Q of 30. This is a factor of three times better than the initial 10. Finally, during optimization, it's important to keep the phase zero crossing at 40 megahertz. The weights allow the user to influence the optimization if the outcomes are not as desired. In this case, the default weights of 1 were used. Given here are the results of the optimization, after about 20 seconds on my Intel Core 2 2.4 GHz CPU, after optimization, I place part values on the nearest standard value. The green variable values were the ones that were optimized. When I placed them on the standard value, it slightly shifted the frequency. So I then tuned C1 to set the phase zero crossing back to 40 megahertz. The loop input and output matches are now better than 12 dB. And the cascade S parameters, rather than G, are displayed. Notice the gain in red has been optimized to near the 60 dB target. And the loaded Q in green is now nearly 30. This is evidenced by the much steeper phase slope. To realize these goals, the optimizer significantly increased the capacitor tap ratio by increasing C2 and decreasing C1. R1 was also significantly increased. This was required to reduce the gain and improve the loop matches. So this completes our initial linear analysis of the 40 megahertz oscillator. 
Earlier I mentioned that for some oscillators, there's no place to open the loop. Unfortunately, I'm unconvinced the one-port method reveals the loaded queue. Recognizing this dilemma, in 1999, Stanislav Alekno suggested a clever way to convert a one-port oscillator so that the loop can be opened. Consider the classic common collector negative resistance oscillator at the upper left. The power supply symbol is also an RF ground. At the upper right, all of the grounds are connected together with a wire, and the ground is moved to the emitter. At the lower left, the circuit is simply redrawn with this new ground reference. At the lower right, the loop can now be opened at the left side of the resonator and the collector. The equivalent open loop schematic at the lower right for this classic negative resistance oscillator reveals a problem that's not obvious from the negative resistance analysis. The phase shift of a series resonator at resonance is zero. And the phase shift of an ideal common emitter amplifier is 180 degrees. So the cascade phase shift at resonance is not zero degrees, so it should not oscillate. In practice, this issue is resolved by using a device whose F sub tau is not much higher than the desired oscillation frequency. It must not act like an ideal inverting amplifier. Even then, extra capacitance to ground at the base in the open loop schematic is often required. Alekno's technique also allows us to see that the loaded queue of this circuit is poor because of the heavily coupled resonator. These issues are not obvious during a negative resistance analysis. The Legno's technique is only approximate unless the device is an ideal control source. However, his method brings insight to oscillators designed using the one port method. We examined the Colbert's oscillator where after optimization, oscillation criteria were well satisfied. In practice, cascading any resonator with any active device may not be successful. While the matches can often be adjusted by modifying part values, it's the critical phase characteristics which are less likely to be satisfied. For example, cascading a common emitter amplifier with a Colpitz type resonator is unlikely to be successful. Historically, successful topologies were named for the discoverer, and they became standard designs. Copying these designs was, and unfortunately still is, common. But even this may not achieve good performance because the response characteristics may not be optimal. By combining linear, nonlinear, and transient simulation, you'll improve performance and better satisfy the requirements of your design. I refer to the techniques I describe as a unified approach to oscillator design because they're general. Whether the resonator is a transmission line or an LC tank or quartz crystal, the methods are the same. Also, the same techniques are, regard are used regardless of the type of active device. In Genesis, one schematic may be used for linear, nonlinear, noise, and transient simulations. This is not only convenient, it eliminates potential errors associated with maintaining multiple schematics. Many texts describe oscillator design based on analytical equations. The difficulty here is, to make the equations of manageable complexity, device models are often reduced to ideal control sources and parasitics are ignored. Using a simulation environment like Genesis allows the user to explore designs with ideal or real devices and parasitics using precisely the same technique. And the linear response can be confirmed by measurement using a network analyzer. OK, enough for the linear uh, starting foundation. Let's proceed beyond to nonlinear simulation. Of course, the final steady state operating mode of most oscillators is not linear. As the signal level builds, the active device is driven nonlinear. The gain compresses, the phase shifts, and the impedances change. A linear oscillator can be built by using AGC rather than relying on limiting. In fact, this was the basis of the first Hewlett-Packard product, 
Bill Hewlett's HP 200A, an audio oscillator. It used the thermal resistance of an incandescent bulb to limit the amplitude rather than vacuum tube compression. There are some examples of this in my book. Since the oscillator operates nearly linear, harmonics were significantly reduced. This also serves as a simple amplitude leveler with tuning. But in most oscillators, it's the nonlinear behavior that establishes the operating level and harmonic content. Therefore, step two, a nonlinear harmonic balance simulation, is used to quantify the level and harmonics. The fundamental source of noise in oscillators is not nonlinear action. Would you expect Bill Hewlett's oscillator to be noise-free? Of course not. The excessive compression can add to the, to, the, to the oscillator noise. This is one reason why the gain margin in an oscillator should not be excessive. Designing for maximum gain margin or maximum negative resistance, as described in some books, is not necessary or even desired. But nonlinear action can contribute to noise, and the harmonic balance routines in Genesis are a more accurate tool for assessing oscillator noise than Leeson's linear method. Also, nonlinear action can shift the device transmission phase, and therefore the operating frequency. In a well-designed oscillator, frequency change is small, but a nonlinear analysis provides a more accurate frequency simulation. Nonlinear simulation requires nonlinear device models. These are more difficult to obtain than linear models. To help, Genesis is bundled with many models from a variety of manufacturers. Also, Genesis imports SPICE models, a common type of nonlinear model. Genesis now supports X parameters. This allows you to base nonlinear models on measured data rather than a physical model that was fit to data. Consider this 330 megahertz bipolar Colpitz oscillator here at the upper left. The open loop cascade input is port 1 on the left, and the output is port 2 on the right. The 270 picofarad capacitor prevents the simulator termination from disturbing the bias. It's not required in the final oscillator. The oscillator output is taken through capacitor C4. Capacitor C3 prevents the inductor from shorting the base bias. Because of the non-zero reactance of C3, this is not truly a Colpitz. In this circuit, the ferrite bead is used at the emitter rather than the base to stabilize the device. At the lower left, the open loop schematic is reused. The wire connects port 1 to port 2, thus closing the loop to form the oscillator. Os port is a Genesis test port of the harmonic balance simulator. It automatically finds the nonlinear oscillator frequency and oscillation amplitude. Port 3 of this schematic becomes the output of the oscillator. Given on the right is the solution with balanced harmonics through the seventh. The oscillation frequency predicted by the linear randall hoke equation is 330 0.86 megahertz. The frequency predicted by nonlinear harmonic balance simulation is 330.028 megahertz. The difference is about 0.25 percent. This shift is caused by amplifier phase shift during device compression. The linear gain margin for this circuit is about 4 dB. Noise analysis in Genesis considers low frequency noise mixed with the carrier, AM to PM conversion noise, translated noise by large signal oscillation, and effects of bias shift by oscillation. Individual sources of noise are tallied and are available for display. The table at the upper left shows the noise index number and the associated descriptor for that source of, source of noise. This table is automatically generated after a nonlinear noise analysis is requested. The table at the lower left provides the noise versus offset frequency for each of these noise sources.
plotted here are the four most significant single sideband noise sources from the nonlinear noise analysis. By providing individual noise contributors, circuit and device parameters that are the primary contributors are easily identified. Now we're ready for step three, the time step simulation by the nonlinear Cayenne simulator. Like SPICE, Cayenne simulates the time step response to an arbitrary input signal. In the book, I treat oscillators starting in detail. Most of us were taught that noise, in the presence of the positive feedback of the closed loop, is the source of starting. In fact, oscillators will start reliably from noise. But in the book, I show that for most oscillators, the natural ringing response of the resonator, induced by turning on the supply, is larger than the noise signal. In fact, even with supply time constants that are many orders of magnitude longer than the oscillation period, the supply transient exceeds the noise level. Most oscillators start simply because they're turned on. Since Cayenne is a time step simulator, no artificial starting technique is required. Simply including the actual power supply bypassing capacitors or time constants and a supply step is all that is required to start the circuit and predict starting characteristics. Cayenne will also identify spurious oscillation modes induced by finite resistance and bypassing in the supply line. In fact, if the output level and waveforms are sufficient and nonlinear noise and detailed harmonic content aren't required, Cayenne may be used as the final step and harmonic balance simulation is not required. Cayenne also uses the original schematic with the ports closed as shown here and an output port, much like the harmonic balance reuse schematic. However, the OS port is not required. Here is the output waveform of the 330 megahertz oscillator beginning at time zero when the supply voltage is stepped on. An instantaneous step is used in this example. The time to 63% of the final voltage is about 30 nanoseconds. Notice the output voltage initially rises to about one volt peak at 80 nanoseconds and then it settles to 0.8 volts peak steady state. At zero seconds, the voltage across C3, this capacitor, is zero. This capacitor is charged via the bias resistors R1 and R2. Until this capacitor is charged, the lower base voltage results in increased collector bias current and therefore a higher oscillator output voltage. It's interesting to note that the time constant of C3 and the bias resistors R1 and R2 is 80 nanoseconds. It's typical that the starting characteristics of an oscillator are defined by the power supply rise time and the charging characteristics of the bias circuitry. The use of small bypass and even RF capacitors will speed starting. Other techniques for speed up are described in the book. Here we see a Genesis screen set up for oscillator design. At the lower left is the open loop schematic of a 330 megahertz clap oscillator. In this case, the oscillator output power is taken across the resonator at the base. At the upper left are the linear open loop transmission and reflection responses. The matches are only fair in this example, and so the randall hope correction is used, and G is plotted. The phase zero crossing occurs well off the maximum phase slope. Because of this, the achieved loaded Q is less than five. When at the maximum phase slope, it's 20. This circuit needs to be optimized. Anyway, the circuit oscillates. The harmonic balance and Cayenne simulations are given in the middle row. This example points out how important complete analysis is. If one constructed a prototype, it would oscillate, actually with good output power and good harmonic performance. But the noise and stability performance would be a mere fraction of that possible if the circuit 
were optimized. I think I've demonstrated that Genesis is a powerful tool for oscillator design. It's an integrated environment for linear, nonlinear, transient, and noise analysis. It supports a process for creating new designs or improving underperforming ones. And interestingly, I recall from the early days of computer-aided engineering, some felt that CAE was dangerous because engineers would use it as a crutch and not really understand how circuits behave. Quite the contrary, I believe software is a powerful learning tool. When used properly to ask questions as well as answer them, it brings insight to the user. I didn't have time today to cover a number of Genesis features that could be used in oscillator design. The first is synthesis. A number of synthesis modules are available in Genesis for oscillators, matching networks, mixers, couplers, phase lock loop, transmission lines, and a wide range of filters. With the oscillator synthesis program, you select a general topology and then enter the key performance characteristic. The synthesis program then computes component values, creates a schematic, and sets up simulations and output graphs. You may then evaluate and modify the design as you wish. Genesis also includes a number of integrated modules for complete design from concept to prototype, including layout, electromagnetic simulation, instrument control of data acquisition, and system simulation. I'd like to finish with a few slides about my latest book. Why did I write this book? My first book only covered nonlinear and transient theory qualitatively. These topics are covered in much more detail in this book. Perhaps most importantly, I've now taught oscillator theory to over a thousand engineers at trade shows, Georgia Tech, and companies worldwide. During these full day sessions, I was asked a lot of very good questions. And some questions kept reoccurring, which meant I needed to rethink how I presented the subject. It was fun and a great learning experience for me. Also, oscillator theory has advanced significantly in the last decade. Modeling has improved. The Randall Hulk and Alecno techniques need to be evangelized. And starting is better understood. There was a lot to write about. Besides, I needed something to do. The book covers subjects I presented today in much more detail, with over 350 illustrations. Very few of the 200 equations are derivations. Most of the equations are there to illustrate important principles or to be used in oscillator design. The book includes 60 example oscillators with measured data for a number of oscillators. All of the schematics and all of the graphs, including graphs of equations, were created using Genesis, which has great features for documentation, whether for your notebook, a technical paper, a proposal, or a book-length project. I used 140 Genesis workspaces to create the examples, schematics, and graphs in the book. Agilent has established a website for downloading 73 of the more important workspaces. And these workspaces may be used with either a full or a trial Genesis license. The workspace template may be used to start an oscillator design. You replace the existing schematic with your proposed open loop schematic. The template includes linear, harmonic balance, time step, and noise simulations, and all output graphs. You then make any required changes to the simulation, such as the frequency range, number of harmonics you want to simulate, and so forth. Some of the workspaces are utilities, for example, for designing amplifiers or resonators. The remaining workspaces are general purpose RC, LC, distributed, VCO, ceramic, crystal, and saw oscillators. The website for downloading these files is given on the last slide. In summary, Genesis is an integrated tool suited for a unified approach to oscillator design. The book covers more detailed information 
and example workspaces are available to make getting started easy. I hope you'll stick around for questions and answers. Uh, you may contact me to request an Excel spreadsheet with most of the equations in the book. You may also report errata or obtain any future errata sheets that I may publish. If you have questions about Genesis, you can visit the Agilent website or contact your Genesis specialist. The workspaces and a free trial Genesis license are also available at the Agilent website. Thanks for attending. OK, Kirk, back to you. All right, Mandy, thank you. In a moment, we're going to begin the question and answer session. But first, I want to remind everyone to complete the survey that will come up at the end of the webcast. And as I mentioned at the beginning, by submitting the survey, you'll be providing us with valuable information on how we can offer more and better webcasts in the future. So please take a moment to do that at the end of the webcast. Now, let's get to your questions and see if we can provide a few answers. As a reminder, if you have a question, simply type it in the chat window and select All Panelists using the drop-down menu. And as I said, you may have to scroll up to get to that All Panelists selection. We do have a large audience today, so if we don't get to your question, we will answer it via email after the webcast. So please ask your questions, and we'll get to them. So here's the first question. And, and uh, Randy, this was asked during slide 7. And uh, it says, it starts out with just a statement, low S11 and S22, is 50 ohms needed? And what what impedance level? Is it relative? In other words, should both be the same or con should both be at the same or conjugate impedance? impedance? Does that make sense? OK. Yeah, yes, that's that's a great question. Uh, and it's it's a question, this whole issue of match is one that, that comes up frequently. Uh, and uh, that's why Mitch Randall and Terry Hoke's contribution was so important, because it basically eliminates any concern. You can choose any termination impedance. And when you compute G from the S parameters, it doesn't make any difference what you chose. Uh, that having been said, there are some advantages to uh, choosing an impedance that uh, is the impedance of your network analyzer, whether it's 50 ohms, 75 ohms, or 600 ohms. It's very convenient if you choose both resistances to be the same. Um, you can choose any resistance level uh, that makes the matches in the open loop cascade the best. So I could choose 60 ohms. I could choose 107 ohms. I can choose whatever resistance I want. Um, but it's amazing how often you can make it work with 50 ohms. The advantage of 50 ohms is it then becomes very easy to confirm the whole design by measuring the open loop cascade, not an oscillator, but measuring the open loop cascade on a network analyzer. Um, so again, uh, normally you would choose the same resistance for the input and the output. It's nice if you can choose 50 ohms. You don't have to. You can choose uh, whatever impedance makes both matches uh, average the best. Uh, but in the end, if you're having trouble getting the system matched, just use uh, uh, the Mitch Randall correction. And you don't even have to worry about either what the resistance is or where you open the loop. OK, great. Next question uh, was around slide 17 or so, and is how is the loaded queue simulated? Um, the loaded, it's important to understand uh, the difference amongst the various queues. Um, a component such as an inductor or a quartz crystal or a transmission line resonator has an intrinsic unloaded queue that is a measure of the quality of that component. And that's where the term Q came from. It represents quality. Uh, in a typical oscillator, you can increase inductor or resonator Q all you want, and it will have minimal impact on the unloaded Q. It's only, excuse me, on the loaded Q. It's only when the loaded Q starts becoming appreciable with respect to the unloaded Q that the unloaded queue really makes any difference. So the loaded queue is, is very much uh, the same as uh, it can be defined as the 3 dB bandwidth of a single resonator. It's the center frequency divided by the 3 dB bandwidth. 
uh, although in oscillators uh, we're more interested in phase and how narrow that amplitude response is will affect the phase uh, steepness. And the loaded queue as computed by the Genesis simulator is basically computed from the phase slope, not the amplitude characteristics of the loop. Um, and it does a discrete uh, differentiation, taking the phase at uh, one frequency and another frequency, and uh, from that slope and frequency difference, uh, computing the loaded queue. It's that loaded queue that is so critical to oscillator performance. Okay, we've got questions flying in left and right here. This one was uh, asked around slide 17 as well, and he asks, can, I, can you elaborate on the sharp phase slope required? He says, isn't the idea to keep the phase as close to zero degrees as possible across frequency considering temperature changes and component tolerances? Okay, this, this uh, question is addressing uh, two different forms of stability, long-term and short-term. Keeping the uh, zero crossing at zero degrees at the desired frequency is what controls the frequency uh, of oscillation, or what we would refer to as the long-term stability. So the frequency of oscillation, not the noise, is determined by the frequency of that phase zero crossing. The short-term stability, or the, the oscillating frequency from quick sample to quick sample, is controlled by the steepness of that phase slope. Um, imagine any disturbance, whether it's temperature or noise, shifting the transmission phase typically of the active device, up or down. If that phase slope is very shallow, that shift up and down in absolute phase is going to cause a large change in the zero crossing frequency. If, on the other hand, you can imagine the phase slope were perfectly steep, perfectly straight up and down, shifting the absolute phase transmission through the device would not change the frequency at all. So it's the steepness that controls the uh, stability with phase changes, and it's uh, the long term or the oscillation frequency is controlled by whatever uh, frequency that phase zero crossing may occur. Okay, great. Uh, next question uh, is uh, just the uh, term Cayenne. I wanted to know, is that a time domain simulator within Genesis? Uh, yes, Cayenne is a time step simulator, much like SPICE. Uh, it's not derived from SPICE code like a lot of time step simulators are, uh, but it's basically using the same principles. And what it does is you can either start Cayenne with zero volts on all components, uh, or you can start it at the initial quiescent voltage. For oscillator design, you would start Cayenne with all voltages at zero, just as if you had an oscillator on the bench that had been turned off for some period of time. All of the voltages are going to settle to zero. And because it is a true time step simulator, if the power that you apply to that circuit in Cayenne is a step, it's basically identical exactly to what happens when you turn an oscillator circuit on. So you don't have to worry about starting. You don't have to uh, induce any starting mechanisms. Um, and you can do this either in Cayenne or SPICE. The mere process of applying power to the circuit will induce a transient ring in the resonator, uh, which then becomes the starting signal for the oscillator. So this process will not only uh, allow the circuit to start, but it actually will predict the actual starting characteristics uh, of your final oscillator. It's important uh, that most power supplies have time, some time constant uh, to rise. Also, bypassing on the power supply will cause a finite time constant. And if you simulate those in your uh, schematic, uh, then it will simulate actual starting in the oscillator. All right, next question, Randy, is uh, what input do you use to simulate the time to steady state behavior? 
Um, one doesn't really have to input anything other than the uh, initial step that occurred um, when you turn the power supply on. So again, if the power supply is not, say, a static uh, 3 volts, but a 3 volt step or a 5 volt step or whatever, uh, and in Cayenne you choose the option for voltages, all voltages to start at zero, then Cayenne will naturally simulate the starting process, and you don't need to inject any signal like you would need to do in harmonic balance. Okay. Uh, the same uh, same questioner asks, uh, also, does the presenter have recommendations for designing for good phase noise besides having a good resonator cue? Uh, there are a number of things that uh, that are important in, in order. A few of them are uh, the phase noise performance is proportional to the Q squared. So it is by far the most important parameter. It tends also to be one uh, over which we have reasonable control. The second most important parameter is power. One wants to uh, have as high a power oscillator as possible. I know this sounds counterintuitive. Power seems like the opposite of noiseless uh, or quiet. But in actual, the single, single sideband phase noise spec is in relation to the carrier. It's noise in relation to the carrier level. The noise processes tend to be constant. So if you can get the carrier level up, you will improve the, uh, the phase noise performance of the oscillator. Uh, power is also uh, a parameter that we have a lot of control over. Um, except those folks who uh, are in limited power applications, handheld applications where uh, battery resources are very important, then uh, that's a major limitation. But otherwise, for base stations in particular, uh, or for uh, supply line uh, oscillators, uh, more power is, uh, is the second most important thing to do. And then there are a bunch of fine details. Uh, Noise figure, you would think noise figure would be important, uh, and it is important to a degree, but keep in mind that uh, the noise figure of inexpensive devices is only a dB or two worse than the noise figure of some of the best devices available today. So noise figure is important, but it's not one that we uh, have a lot of control over. And my book discusses a whole plethora of uh, things that are important in low noise oscillator design, which is a major state of the art issue associated with oscillators. Okay. We've got one here I'll direct to uh, Hao Xiang Yap. Uh, again, he's the product manager of Genesis and product planner for Genesis here at Agilent ESOF. And uh, one attendee writes, uh, How much does Genesis cost? All right. Um, to find out more about Genesis, you can just Google Agilent Genesis, and it will bring you to the Genesis homepage. Uh, basically, there are nine bundles of Genesis, and the price ranges from less than $5,000 all the way to $29,000, where we include everything that Genesis has to offer. OK, great. Thanks, Hsing. Uh Randy, back, back to you for one. Uh, up to what frequencies will Genesis simulate to? Uh, Genesis will simulate up to whatever frequency um, that can be simulated electrically. Um, of course, for Genesis to be accurate, the models have to uh, accurately represent the devices being simulated. But in essence, there's no practical frequency limit uh, on the simulation theory and technology. It becomes an issue of modeling, uh, and uh, that's a very complex issue, of course. Um, the Once you get above, and it, again, it depends on the type of oscillator you're working with, but once you get above a few hundred megahertz, electromagnetic simulation can help significantly with modeling issues of pads and transmission lines and the rest of the circuitry. Uh, so. Uh, Below a few hundred megahertz, electromagnetic simulation may not be necessary. But if you're working at really high frequencies, uh, electromagnetic simulation is, needs to augment it 
augment the uh, circuit theory techniques we discussed today. Okay, that uh, leads to a, to a related question. Probably, how soon you could address this? What kind of EM simulator comes with Genesis? Is it full 3D for DROs? He was surprised by the availability of harmonic balance on Genesis. All right, um, the EM simulator that comes with Genesis, it's based on the method of moment, so it's not based on full 3D, but it is 3D planar an electromagnetic simulator. It's uh, called Momentum, it has a history of 20 years of development, it's also the same simulator used in our bigger uh, design tool called the Advanced Design System. Okay, thanks, Yang. Uh Another question for Randy. Any examples available where a parametric amplifier stage is used in place of discrete? Um, well, uh, the first amplifier, one of the first amplifiers I ever built was, uh, was a parametric amplifier. Uh, I used it as a low-noise LNA before transistors were uh, very quiet uh, to listen to Apollo signals, I constructed a, um, uh, a home Earth station that listened to uh, Apollo while they were circling the moon. So I have some experience with them. Um, parametric devices typically are characterized as a one-port device. Um, and I see no, I haven't done any experimentation with paramps in a long, long time. But I don't see any reason why a Veractor or uh, other uh, nonlinear device could not be pumped and uh, a negative resistance developed and an oscillator uh, built from that. I have no experience doing it, but I don't see a limitation in Genesis that would preclude that. Okay. Uh, another question here are uh, what, what's the best and correct way to measure crystal quality? Uh, again, uh, this is something I address uh, in the book. The short of it is that uh, the unloaded Q of a crystal oscillator is uh, basically the motional, the reactance of the motional inductance or the motional capacitance, and approximate values are generally available from the crystal manufacturers. Uh, it's the ratio of that reactance to the series resistance of crystals, which uh, in the lower megahertz range tends to be 100 ohms or so. As you get up to 20 megahertz, it tends to be more like 10 to 20 ohms. So the unloaded Q of the quartz crystal is uh, that motional reactance divided by that series resistance. Um, the loaded Q in an oscillator circuit is a function of how that crystal is coupled to the circuit. And there's uh, considerable discussion of that uh, in my book and examples of, of ratios of loaded to unloaded Qs. Um, a good crystal oscillator can achieve 50 to 60 percent uh, unloaded Q, 50 to 60 percent of, excuse me, 50 to 60 percent loaded Q of the unloaded Q. So if the unloaded Q is 100,000, you should be able to achieve a uh, loaded Q in an oscillator of 50 to 60,000, but you may have to be careful to do that. OK. To do a VCO, can you simply assume that one of the capacitors in the feedback divider is variable? What else do you need to consider? Um, that's one nice thing about the linear simulation. It's very, very quick for assessing tuning characteristics. And um, if the tuning range is, uh, you know, 50% or less, generally just uh, tuning uh, a capacitor in the tank will get the job done. To achieve octave uh, tuning rates, uh, you may have to tune not only a resonator capacitor, but a feedback capacitor as well. Uh, the negative resistance oscillators, and in particular, the negative conductance oscillators, uh, tend to be a very good uh, approach to designing wide tuning VCOs. Um, there's also a particular circuit uh, in the book uh, that, uh, and I'm trying to remember the name, the Vacker. Uh, there's an oscillator called a Vacker that uses only one tuning reactor, and it has an extremely good 
tuning characteristics. Uh, they tend to work best at lower frequencies. Um, so in short, uh, you can tune the, uh, the oscillator simply by tuning any reactor in the, in the resonator. Uh, for wide tuning, you may have to tune multiple uh, reactors. Okay. I think we have time for one more question here. Are, are active device libraries provided with Genesis transistors, reactors, etc.? cetera? Uh, yes, uh, and it has uh, since, since the beginning. And uh, in the old days, we provided S-parameter files for literally thousands of popular devices. Uh, S-parameter files are still commonly used today for linear simulation only. To do nonlinear simulation, you need to use nonlinear models. And uh, Genesis comes with nonlinear models from a variety of uh, manufacturers, um, Siemens and, and Philips and, uh, and some U.S. Uh, manufacturers, uh, some of the Motorola discrete devices that are now manufactured by other companies uh, have uh, models in Genesis. And also, as I mentioned in the presentation, Genesis will import a SPICE file. So as long as you can get the manufacturer to provide you a SPICE file, you can use it in Genesis. OK, I think that's about all we have time for for questions. Let's uh, just get some closing comments from you, Andy, and then uh, I'll close it off. All right. Well, thanks for all those great questions. Uh, from having taught, uh, taught a full-day oscillator course before, uh, some of them are kind of familiar. It's amazing how some of the same uh, issues concern designers uh, over the years, and some great questions. This year marks the 25th anniversary of the founding of Eagleware. And as founder, I speak for the employee owners of the former Eagleware Alonix in commending Agilent ESOF for continuing to offer and develop Genesis. While I'm retired, many of the employee owners who were so dedicated in making Genesis the great tool that it is still work at Agilent ESOF today. I hope you find Genesis a great tool and a joy to you. OK, Kirk, All right. uh, you can wrap it up. Thank you, Andy. It was a great presentation and, and appreciate all the answers. Uh, as we wrap up today's webcast, I want you to know that we will email everyone a link when the on-demand version of this webcast and the PDF slides are posted on our website. And that email will also include a link to the 70 or 73 Genesis workspaces that are used in Randy's book. If you want this information now, just Google forwards Agilent Genesis Oscillator Book, and that will get you the information. Uh, our next Innovation in EDA uh, webcast will be on October 28th, and it is entitled A Practical Approach to Verifying RFICs with Fast Mismatch Analysis. If you're viewing the on-demand version of this webcast and have a question about any of the material, please email haosiangyap at agilent.com. That's H-O-W hyphen S-I-A-N-G underscore Y-A-P at agilent.com. I'd also like to remind on-demand viewers to please fill out and submit the webcast survey. I'd like to thank everyone for attending today's event, Discrete Oscillator Design Tools and Techniques, brought to you by Agilent ESOF. There were, uh, uh, there's actually pages of questions here, and we will be uh, answering those questions via e email in the, in the coming days. The copyright of the presentation materials is owned by Agilent Technologies. For a current schedule of live and on-demand events, please visit us at www.agilent.com forward slash find forward slash events. Thank you for joining us and have a great day.